Well, hello, everyone, and, and uh, thanks a lot for tuning in to the History Consortium's continuing programs on Civil War topics this week. And tonight, well, you just have to allow me a little bit of a, a, a personal uh, statement here because we have one of my favorite authors of one of my favorite books, Marching Home, Union Veterans in their Unending Civil War. I uh, saw this book at the Gettysburg Library when it first came out. I loved it so much. I read it twice before I took it back, and I had to have my own copy. And uh, doing an interpretation, a hist living history interpretation of a Civil War veteran, this has become my Bible. So I'm so excited that we have the author of this book tonight, Dr. Math Brian Matthew Jordan, who is Associate Professor of U.S. Civil War History and chair of the history department at Sam Houston University. And he's been there since 2015. And Dr. Jordan earned his uh, master's degrees, both from Yale and his doctorate from Yale as well. And his dissertation won quite a few awards at Yale. And I should also mention that uh, Dr. Jordan is a Gettysburg College graduate. So I am so excited uh, to have Dr. Jordan tonight. So Brian, it's all yours. Well, thank you so very much, Jeff, uh, for the introduction and indeed for the invitation to be with you as a part of uh, this Civil War week uh, for a timely discussion uh, with Veterans Day approaching of our, our Civil War veterans. I first started thinking about uh, the veterans of our nation's fratricidal conflict um, more than 20 years ago, when as a young Civil War buff, I got to know a man in my hometown of Akron, Ohio, who had passed his own childhood crisscrossing the Midwest in search of some of the last survivors of Lincoln's armies. Gary Dillon loved those men and the stories that he told about wrinkled old soldiers puffing on fat cigars, swapping their battle stories, at once made the Civil War real and immediate for me. Gary told me about uh, his attendance at the 105th birthday party for Alvin Smith, Ohio's last surviving African-American veteran. He lived in a little cottage on Hazel Street in Akron and could still recall with precision the price, $765.50, that his mother had fetched on a Richmond slave auction block. He recalled for me his journey out to Wauseon, Ohio, where he met with Uncle Dan Klingeman, who presented to Gary the, the copy of the program that he'd received at the 1938 Blue-Gray reunion in Gettysburg, the final meeting of Union and Confederate veterans on the occasion of that cataclysmic battle's 75th anniversary. Told me about going up to, to Rochester, New York to meet with the 111 year old cigar chomping James A. Hard, who fought in the 34th New York at Antietam and Fredericksburg. And reliably, tears would well behind Gary's unusually thick lenses whenever he would tell me about the two rail journeys he took up to Duluth, Minnesota, where he finally met his venerable old pen pal, Albert Wilson the very last survivor of the Grand Army of the Republic, indeed the last military participant uh, of the Civil War to survive, who died in August of 1956 at the age of 109. He'd been a drummer boy in the 1st Minnesota Regiment, hadn't seen combat, but saw um, plenty of marching in the war's final year. They were men set apart, Gary told me on one occasion as we poured over these oversized scrapbooks that he so lovingly maintained, teeming with yellowed newspaper clippings and snapshots that he had captured of these veterans. They were men set apart. Even after so many decades, one got the sense that they had never really put the war behind them. And indeed, I suppose in many ways, I never really put that haunting remark behind me. When I went off to, to graduate school, um, I discovered much to my surprise as I was casting about for a dissertation topic that scholars, professional historians, scarcely knew Civil War veterans. They certainly did not know them in the intimate and real way that, that Gary Dillon had. 
On that rare occasion when Civil War veterans became uh, the subjects of our histories, they were rendered as, as flat caricatures. Billy Yank, it was supposed, beat a, a hasty retreat from the killing fields of the Civil War, only to slip into a welcoming northern civilian society with great ease. Union victory, after all, according to our traditional time-honored narratives, was something that was relatively painless and unproblematic. In 1987, uh, Gerald Linderman, in a very important book called Embattled Courage, the experience of combat in, in the Civil War, he argued that Union veterans, after returning home, that they, they slipped into a sort of self-imposed hibernation during which they refused to, to write or to speak or to even think about the war. They turned rapidly from the conflict, he argued. The implications of this argument were enormous. According to Linderman, Union veterans slumbered as the nation retreated from the radical promises of the war and Reconstruction. They became almost complicit in, in Linderman's estimation, the failures of, of Reconstruction only to awaken from their slumber in the Gilded Age and make gluttonous demands on the federal treasury as pension beggars. And almost predictably, uh, according to the traditional narrative, they embraced their former enemies in the twilight of their lives, extending their hands across that low stone fence that rambled down Cemetery Ridge at Gettysburg in a gesture of reconciliation that uh, achieved national healing at the expense of, of racial justice. That was the traditional narrative when I first started thinking about and working on Union veterans. But in my talk tonight, I'm gonna paint a remarkably different portrait, indeed in some ways an almost counterintuitive picture of the road that led uh, from Appomattox. First, I will argue that for the men of the Union Army, the war's demands persisted in a way that mocked the peace that they had fought so hard and suffered so very long to achieve, rendering impossible right, the kind of hibernation that Gerald Linderman had once described. Union veterans, of course, tended to a staggering litany of physical, psychological, and emotional scars. Wounds that provided ready-made metaphors for the tentative and as yet uncertain nature of the war's verdict, as it appeared in 1865, looking out and beyond. Indeed, Union veterans believed, and I think remarkably so, that their military victory had neither settled the war's central issues nor resolved the ultimate fate of the Union. They became self-appointed arbiters of the war's history, very self-conscious students of 1861-1865, bound and determined to preserve something of the war's meaning for future generations. But in that effort, of course, they were vexed by white northern civilians, men, women, and children who were eager to let bygones be bygones, who wanted to move quickly beyond the painful issues raised by the war. White Northern civilians deemed most returning Union soldiers unwelcome and unsettling reminders of a past that they wanted only to forget. The war that Billy Yank fought, in other words, was profoundly not the war that his fellow countrymen remembered in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Now, this would decidedly not be the case in the immediate post-Civil War South. Well, Johnny Reb, no doubt, nursed the same frayed nerves and blasted hopes as Billy Yank. He returned, I think it's important to say, to a civilian society that had shared in the experience of war, that had shared very tangibly in the experience of defeat. The scars of Johnny Reb's war could neither be denied nor easily erased. John Townsend Trowbridge, the New York-born journalist who made a now-famous tour of the defeated South in the spring and summer of 1865, 
he makes this point very clear in a narrative when he surveyed the monotonous gloom he wrote of broken pillars and dilapidated porches, of roofless homes, cracked slabs, shell-pocked walls. John Townsend Trowbridge pointedly observed that those haughty secessionist multitudes of 1861 had been replaced in 1865 by knots of half-asleep civilians. The only sign of life in the defeated South immediately after the Civil War, Trowbridge wrote, seem to be those turkey buzzards circling mournfully overhead. Now, none of this, of course, came as any immediate relief to Johnny Reb. And there were other powerful, potent reminders of Confederate defeat stalking the streets, too. Most dramatically in the form of the African-American soldiers who shouldered the muskets of a federal military occupation that would only tighten its tenuous hold over the defeated South in the summer of 1865, exacerbating racial tensions. But pause a second, one Confederate veteran protested, and you can hear our master's shout of triumph ringing through the streets. And yet these things did combine, I think, to ensure that Johnny Reb returned home to a civilian society, a white civilian society, a community that understood keenly his need to make sense of the past, his need to work through the war and the experience of defeat. A community that shared tragically his longing for those ostensibly halcyon days when cotton was king, a community that would forge with and around him the lost cause mythology that knot of ideas which posited that the war had not been waged on behalf of slavery, but rather they'd been waged against the overweening powers of a federal government whose overwhelming resources and military might had made the fight unfair. If victory invited Northerners to look ahead to the freewheeling bounty of the Gilded Age, then defeat of its own bleak necessity invited all Southerners to look back, to marinate in the past. And that harmonized in a cultural sense, I think, much more readily with the needs of Southern veterans than it did for our Northern friends. And so part of what I wanna to do tonight is to suggest the limits of the traditional categories that we have uh, used uh, to describe Civil War veterans. Neither victors nor victims, they were survivors all. Men who were never really certain of the war's verdict, men who lived on never really comfortable with putting away the scenes of the past. Indeed, the war continued to go on. Billy Yank won the war, but couldn't bear the peace that followed while Johnny Reb achieved a sort of cultural victory with his defeat. Ultimately, the experiences of Civil War veterans remind us that the stories we tell ourselves as a nation about war matter. They matter deeply. That public memory, historical memory, far from being some academic abstraction, it can have some real powerful, tragic social consequences, lived consequences in the lives of our veterans. Now, the Civil War, as you know, raged on for four bloody years, a conflict of almost unimaginable scope and scale. No one in 1861 could have prepared themselves for the extent of the war's carnage, obscenity, and death. To speak only of the human cost, some 752,000 military men would be killed between 1861 and 1865, nearly 3% of the population enumerated in the 1860 federal census. Another million would count themselves among the wounded by the time all was said and done. At least 25,000 men staggered north, missing an arm 
or a leg. Countless unnamed others bore the psychological scars. Never before or since in all of American history were so many men at a single time called veterans. But just as the nation was unprepared for the war, so too would it be unprepared for the peace that followed. Of course, a generation that had no veterans administration, no definition of veterans' rights, no diagnostic language to describe combat stress or what we today might term post-traumatic stress. For mangled and maimed survivors of the Union Army then, pain, pain proved to be the first obstacle to work through. And the first obstacle to the sort of forgetfulness that many white Northern civilians were eager to impose on the past. Each throb, each twinge, each sting, prolonged and magnified reminiscences of the war. Ensure that the war was not something they could easily put away. Our feelings, one veteran acknowledged, our feelings will last a lifetime. This was, to borrow from the historian Drew Gilpin Faust's formulation, a living republic of suffering. 24-year-old Daniel Eldridge was a New Hampshire veteran who returned home with several fragments of rebel lead painfully wedged between the tendons of his left arm, a souvenir of the Battle of Beat Bottom in Virginia in July of 1864. Rather than be silenced by his injuries, rather than slip into the period of hibernation, Dan Eldridge was almost immediately activated by his injuries. Each day he toiled on a memoir of his service, every new word sending currents of pain traveling along his fractured limb. He set out in the immediate days of his homecoming to write a, a short narrative of his military service, what he thought would consume no more than a dozen pages of fool's cap. But urgent daily work on the memoir had by 1867 brought that narrative to more than 600 pages, profusely illustrated with dozens of hand-inked campaign and battle maps. His injury demanded context and meaning. And the young soldier literally wrote through his pain in an inspiring search for both, a process that was replicated hundreds of thousands of times in the immediate years after the war. Even those who returned without the physical injuries like Dan Eldridge found that the war was something difficult to escape. It continued to annex ordinary lives. The momentous events of less than 10 years ago are too fresh in memory to be forgotten at the command of any party that might be benefited by ignoring them, one veteran snarled. Conceding that the Civil War was the most intense experience of their lives, indeed, think of all of the conflicting emotions that have been packed into that surreal space of two or three or four years. Men who spent years yearning for home, for the comforts of peace, now felt oddly discomfited at the absence of war. Longing for the peculiar and now oddly comforting sounds of, of battle, some veterans placed surplus percussion caps and spare friction primers on active railroad tracks and waited anxiously for the explosions. They even staged, with great fidelity, sham battles on town greens all across the North in a dual effort to both relive the drama and school the stay-at-homes about what they'd experienced. In 1871, a Wisconsin man, known to mutter incomprehensibly about his military service and a certain Captain Chase, pounded a line of sticks into the ground behind his brother-in-law's barn. And by moonlight, every night, in perfect military order, 
command his white bulldog to charge what he called his imaginary rebel picket line. He needed to go through that reenactment every night and would do so until his brother-in-law finally had him packed off in 1885 to the Wisconsin Hospital for the Insane. Still others had very little need for such physical reenactments because the war was something that still rang in their ears and flashed before their eyes. Henry Hartwell, an artillerist from Michigan, claimed in June of 1865 that he'd never really left Chickamauga. The rebels had seized one of his guns in the, a fierce Georgia battle. And even yet, the veteran claimed, he could still see the rebel hosts as they rested the rammers from the gunner's hands. He could still distinctly hear the volcanic discharges as they dealt death upon the advancing foe. These men quickly apprehended that their broken bodies and haunted minds were apt metaphors for what they believed to be the yet uncertain verdict of the war. Indeed, one-armed and one-legged men they became some of the most vocal among Union veterans. A stunning number of amputees appreciating the, the testimonial power of their hacked and hewed frames refused to wear ill-fitting government-issued prosthetic appliances and instead sat for photographs that prominently displayed their exposed stumps to offer witness, to bear witness to all that the war had visited on their bodies. Newspapers north and south began carping about the one-legged soldiers who waved their crutches all over the news, all over the north, with the news that the war is not yet over. The maimed and the crippled ones, a one-armed Iowa ex-soldier explained, speak with living tongues of the crimes of the Copperheads and the open rebels. And so while Union veterans never failed to declare their pride in having fought for what they believed to be the just and righteous cause, they nonetheless insisted self-effacingly that their victory was incomplete. We might well have hoped that when that last rebel surrendered, when our arms were victorious everywhere, one Union veteran grieved in October of 1866, peace and concord and unity would prevail. But of course it did not. The South offered little reassurance that it would acquiesce to any brokered peace. The unprecedented assassination of a president, cruel race riots that romped through Norfolk and Memphis and New Orleans, the rebels who exchanged gray uniforms for white hoods, the return of the antebellum social and political leadership to positions of prominence and power all across the South, these things combined to leave Union veterans wondering in the summer of 1865 and beyond if indeed they'd actually won the war after all. In Charleston, South Carolina, that first summer after the war, there were 138 reported, documented assaults on formerly enslaved persons that first summer alone. Billy Yank's keen sense of what he fought for might have steeled him for the storm of battle. But now, ironically enough, it rattled him in the throes of the peace. Billy Yank looked on as his former enemies, reassured by their escape from reprisal, reassured by their pardons from Andrew Johnson, defiantly belted the South with repressive black codes. We see every day the old hostility cropping out and continued acts of antagonism to the Reconstruction laws of Congress, insisted one veteran. The animus of treason and rebellion is as deadly and vindictive now as it was in 1861. The Minnesotan Miles Hollister was, was likewise unsatisfied with the war's results. Let me see my country placed in the hands of her defenders, he began. Let me see peace and quiet and harmony and brotherly love and friendship 
and law and order prevail throughout the lands in all sections, he declared. And then, then when these results have been fully accomplished and the nation is in the full enjoyment of the fruits thereof, only then will I willingly go down to my grave, though I may go down unwept, unhonored, and unsung. In short, contrary to Gerald Linderman's arguments about hibernation, Union veterans refused to go quietly in the face of the pardons and the lynchings and the rumors of another rebellion, another rebellion that threatened to make a rather bloodless skirmish of the first. It becomes our duty now, declared one Pennsylvania veteran, to set ourselves at work and to reap the fruits of our victory. Indeed, for many Union ex-soldiers, reaping the fruits of victory meant meeting out punishment for treason, the great crime of the rebels. Even if that meant compromising the classical small-R Republican citizen soldiers' obligation to return home and quickly perfume the whiff of anything martial. What will all the blood and treasure expended by the loyal people of this republic amount to if men and measures of the late rebellion shall be again permitted to rule, one vexed ex-soldier asked. A second lieutenant from Ohio was even more candid. I'm not in good humor with the rebels yet, he said, wishing only for one more opportunity, as he put it, to finish them off. They have caused too much loss of life and too much suffering to be easily or effortlessly forgotten. One survivor of Andersonville, the Confederacy's notorious prison hell in southwestern Georgia, volunteered to construct a wooden scaffold for ex-Confederate President Jefferson Davis. Oh, I'd like to be the one to lend a helping hand, he wrote the first summer after the war. Through the divine providence of God, I have been spared to witness the close of this wicked and unjust rebellion. He was a carpenter before the war, and he included in his petition to the new president, Andrew Johnson, blueprints for the gibbet that he proposed to erect on the western face of the Capitol building. Around the country, veterans' organizations passed resolutions demanding the execution of Jeff Davis, of Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens, of Robert E. Lee, of other high-ranking Confederate authorities. Only then would the Union be secure, they argued. Still other veterans resolved that their work would not be complete until African Americans, formerly enslaved persons, had secured both civil and political rights. Dozens of ex-Union soldiers volunteered to garrison the South in the armies of the occupation, which, much to the chagrin of white Southerners, defended formerly enslaved persons and encouraged them to resist iniquitous labor contracts. Other Union veterans assumed leadership positions in the Freedmen's Bureau, served as subassistant commissioners of the Bureau, tasked with managing the transition between slavery and freedom. Still others took charge of the South's first free public schools. The claim, I think, should be made with some caution. But as the historian Chandra Manning and others have argued, Billy Yank assumed a position far in advance of his pre-war self, and certainly far in advance of post-war white northern civilian society on the questions of race. There were many great questions which we had not thought much upon before the war, one veteran candidly explained on Memorial Day, 1868, reproaching Andrew Johnson for his vile brand of reconstruction. My comrades, we today at the graves of our fallen brethren, we hurl our rebuke to narrow-mindedness and unfairness. We declare that we believe in the largest 
liberty for all men, irrespective of nation or color. No reconciliation, two comrades concluded, can endure which is not founded in justice. And especially is no reconciliation sure to abide, which is not devoted to the highest and the best interests of the whole country as a country of freedom. Union veterans were not unilaterally opposed to sectional reunion then. After all, that was one of the great aims of the war. But they did demand a measured sort of sectional reconciliation, one that was mindful of the war's personal costs and its ostensible political results. But this was anathema to many white Northerners, which leads me to this important point. The Union veterans returned home in the spring and summer of 1865, only to find themselves fighting another war, a war with white Northern civilians. While Union victory was no doubt loudly cheered in the spring and summer of 1865, the hymns of that ovation hardly drowned out the bitter social and political dramas that had roiled the wartime Northern home front. Union veterans returned, after all, to a civilian population that had rioted, that had resisted, that had reached no consensus about the meaning of the war, the participation of so many men in great violence, the necessity, political, military, or otherwise, of emancipation. By exalting the, the end of hostilities, by declaring the Union saved and enslaved persons freed, Instead, Northerners dismissed the extent to which the war had left behind some significant unfinished business. But the rhetorical alchemy that transmuted stumps weeping pus into unambiguously honorable scars, civilians foreclosed most any chance for Union veterans to share candidly and openly their horrific war stories. And civilians could hardly countenance their ugly tales. Even the few periodical editors who opted to publish their words did so only after deleting so-called harsh adjectives. And none of this was lost on the war's blue-coated ex-soldiers. As modern war psychologists like Robert J. Lifton and Jonathan Shea have pointed out, sharing stories, finding a receptive and a respectful audience for them is a crucial part of any veteran's return to civilian life. Billy Yank would impatiently wait as white Northerners swiftly embraced the spirit of sectional reconciliation, an empty reconciliation that rendered the war both segregated and sterilized. Civilians were wearied of war work, unable to comprehend the tempest of, of battle. They lacked for the most part, any activating sympathy for the plight of the formerly enslaved. Already, one cantankerous Michigan soldier grumbled the day before Lee's surrender. Reverend Henry Ward Beecher had commenced to preach forgiveness and forgetfulness of the past. Ready to let bygones be bygones, civilians largely ignored the social problems that attended demobilization. Northerners, as the historian Jason Sokol has pointed out in a recent book on race in the 20th century, have consistently advanced a, a selective interpretation of their past, one that cleverly circumvents interpretive snarls, one that celebrates the region as a region, a bastion of unimpeachable virtue. Now, true to form, Northern wartime voluntary aid societies like the Sanitary Commission and the Christian Commission that had done such great and laudable work during the war, they shattered their headquarters by October of 1865 and instead got to work, quite literally, debating how best to commemorate their own heroism. State yeah. legislatures from Ohio to Iowa to New York uh, were deeply skeptical of legislation that would have provided temporary homes for dislocated soldiers. Plans for a federal soldier's home met with maddening delays. 
It took more than a year to seat the quorum of the congressionally appointed board of managers for what became known as the National Home for the Disabled Volunteer Soldier, which initially had four campuses and 8,000 beds for a population of over 2.1 million Union veterans. It was an age ruled by the law of local sympathy, of laissez-faire individualism, when the problems of readjustment could be effortlessly attributed not to the war, but rather to individual idiosyncratic character flaws. Believing Billy Yank somehow morally depraved by the experience of combat, many employers refused to hire him. Unemployment rates among veterans soared as veterans took to begging in the streets and hand organ grinding. Scarcely two months after the welcome home celebration that greeted Billy Yank in lower Manhattan, a parade of more than 300 unemployed Union veterans advanced down Broadway, the first major veterans parade after the Civil War. The self-styled former employees of Grant and Sheridan hoisted banners into the air demanding work and wages. But as one veteran Dofle concluded when the event was over, the good people of this country, they're tired of giving and are disgusted at the sight of the crippled relic of the war. In the London, Connecticut, Mayor Frederick Lee Allen deemed an intolerable nuisance two veterans who made a living begging for spare change on the village green. He ordered them to leave town at once. And veterans documented thousands of similar indignities in the pages of their periodicals all across the North. This treatment prompted many ex-soldiers to lapse into expressions of outright hatred for those who had stayed at home, or those in some cases who had purchased a substitute or else dodged the draft. Betrayal could ooze from these veterans' pens. A nation, a state, a county, a town, a city, a people that will allow maimed and crippled soldiers to be sent to poor houses, that will compel them to beg from house to house about the streets for the necessaries of life, one Illinois regimental surgeon concluded, is not fit to enjoy the blessings of a free and enlightened government. What do they know of the sufferings of our poor comrades who were starved to death in Andersonville, Belle Isle, Danville, and other rebel dens, one distraught comrade asked. What do they know of the horrors of the battlefields of Antietam, of Gettysburg, the wilderness, Cedar Creek, Winchester, Chickamauga, and hundreds of others? Ironically enough, the civilian's insistent plea to put away the scenes of the war only lent additional weight to Billy Yank's keen intuition that he could not. Our people, our people are too ready to forget the cause of the boys in blue, one veteran bewailed. Predicting somewhat accurately that unwise deference to the feelings of the pardoned rebels would prompt future generations to reflect upon the, the Civil War merely as a duel where the opposing parties met to fight and then shake hands. Union veterans demanded a solemn and sober remembrance of the past. So deep a wound as this country's just received, one veteran explained, cannot be healed in but a day. In the face of the civilians' willed forgetfulness then, with no place to share their stories, many veterans turned to alcohol or worse to the opium that they had first sampled in the Civil War field hospitals. An honorably discharged second lieutenant who lived in a Philadelphia hotel, known to boast about the cache of captured rebel firearms he stored in his room, was arrested in July of 1865 for public intoxication after he began behaving like a mad dog. 
noisily barking and repeatedly biting himself. By 1867, intemperance among Union veterans had become such a pressing northern dilemma that a former army nurse issued an impassioned plea to the New York State Liquor Dealers Association, imploring it to revoke the vendor's licenses of anyone known to furnish spirits to Civil War veterans. A few veterans took even more desperate action. Northern newspapers reported with sad frequency the details of successful and unsuccessful suicide attempts among Union veterans. One Massachusetts soldier consumed a lethal dose of rat poison, while another donned his blue uniform one last time and splayed himself across the tracks of the Hudson River Railroad in New York City to await the Poughkeepsie Express locomotive that would crush his body. He placed his discharge papers on his person as a surrogate suicide note. A slender tobacco-spitting misanthrope known to history only as Charlie the Boatman split his throat one evening in the boathouse at the Milwaukee Soldier's Home, surrounded by the silvery wads of tinfoil that he'd passed countless hours shaping into cannonballs. Cannonballs, he said, like the one that had hurtled toward him at Shiloh. Others necessarily turned inward to one another. They organized for their own relief, made routine calls on the sick, appealed to one another for much needed financial aid. Indeed, the Grand Army of the Republic, the largest of the fraternal societies for Northern veterans, organized in April of 1866, ought to, I think, rank in our narratives, not as some crass adjunct to the Republican Party, not as Ulysses S. Grant's campaign army, but rather as one of the most engaged and successful social welfare organizations devoted to combating poverty in the 19th century. It was the GAR that helped to heat veterans' homes for the winter, that paid for costly medical procedures the government refused to pay for, that planted soldiers in paupers' graves. Most immediately, the, the boys in blue, in the guise of the GAR, demanded what they called the simple justice of the nation's gratitude stridently lobbying state legislatures and the federal government for soldiers' homes, for government jobs, for hiring preferences, for pension benefits. These veterans around GAR campfires articulated a strikingly novel and strikingly modern ideology of veterans' rights. Does the Republic owe the soldier nothing for daring death that it might live? One veteran's newspaper, the Grand Army Journal, asked in 1870. Were there no promises held out to him that if he fought the good fight, his gallantry would be remembered? If it be a weakness in us to, to cherish old memories, yet deal tenderly with us, one old soldier implored. Suffer us why we do live. Still, the civilians continued to deride Union veterans as nuisances, nuisances with an unhealthy addiction to the past. They proposed to, to keep alive the wrath and the bitterness of that dreadful time, one Northern editor insisted. We say, let all the fearful memories of the past sink into the hell to which they belong, let us think only of wounds to be healed, of harvests to grow again, of seas once more covered in the ships of our commerce, of education for the ignorant, protection to the oppressed, justice for all. So it was that Union veterans won the Civil War, but couldn't bear the peace that followed. As late as 1885, a full decade after some of the most horrifically maimed and grievously wounded veterans had already passed away, 
Indeed, a quarter of a million Union soldiers would die between 1865 and 1875 directly of battlefield-related injuries. As late as 1885, a full decade after all of that, some 23,000 Union veterans dwelled in homeless shelters or in county poorhouses. Civil War veterans were indeed, as Gary Dillon once described them, men set apart. If they lost the battle in their own lifetime for the cultural narrative of the war, they nonetheless ensured that the conflict would only fitfully, fitfully fade into the peace. Historians have only recently begun to consider how the Civil War continued to exact its punishing demands after Appomattox and beyond. Seeming finality of that surrender meeting in Wilmer McLean's parlor, together with the perfectly dressed ranks of the Grand Review, have concealed the gnawing uncertainty and raw emotion that eddied in the immediate post-war years. Union victory, after all, was in that moment hardly a transparent statement of fact. It demanded much, it settled less. In resolving the fate of human slavery in America, the Civil War only raised new and more difficult, more demanding questions. The war was, as Walt Whitman put it, a many-threaded drama. Its riddles continued to taunt and to vex long after the stacking of the muskets. Veterans who spent the rest of their lives leaning into crutches, begging for spare change, guzzling bottles of rum. They make this painfully evident and obvious to us. Because Appomattox was hardly the end. In many ways, it was only the beginning. If old soldiers never die, the wars they fight linger. As a nation once again occupying that strange and liminal space that we so unthinkingly and churlishly call the post-war. As a nation yet without any collective or meaningful ritual of reintegration. As a nation where on average 23 military personnel commit suicide every day. As a nation where 49,000 veterans of the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan dwell in homeless shelters. We need to hear and heed the lessons of Billy Yank urgently and more than ever. Thank you so much for your kind attention this evening. And at this point, I would be happy to engage in conversation and take your questions. All right, and the first question I have here in the chat is the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, accepted USCT veterans, African-American veterans who fought in United States colored troops. How were the USCT veterans treated and was there any significant respect for their contributions? Um, I should point out that uh, the GAR is the only non-segregated fraternal society in late 19th century America. Uh, it's a, a pretty remarkable statement um, to make. The GAR was colorblind. While there were certainly, especially in the South, some segregated posts, the national organization was integrated. The bonds of comradeship transcended race. And the contributions of African-American soldiers at places like Millican's Bend and Chafin's Farm and Newmarket Heights uh, they would not be forgotten. Indeed, I think it's it's really striking if you go into many northern cemeteries. Um, northern cemeteries, of course, in this immediate post-Civil War period are segregated places. The only place that you'll find white people and black people buried next to one another is in the GAR section. Right? There was acknowledgement of what these folks had done. 189,000 African-American soldiers free blacks and formerly enslaved enlisting uh, and arguably um, ensuring that uh, the union could win the war. They never forgot that. Um, and they would be a part of 
the GAR to, to the very end. So a very, very important and good question. Another question is coming in. How did U.S. veterans respond when Confederate monuments went up? A, a, a timely question. And the answer to that is that they exploded in rage and indignation, many of them. Um, there was uh, an official moratorium that Union veterans placed on the erection of Confederate monuments um, on battlefields. Um, the GAR and Union veterans organizations were some of the first superintendents of places like Gettysburg, other sites of Union victory, and they insisted that there be no Confederate markers uh, on those fields. Uh, when Confederate monuments started to go up um, in the late 19th century, kind of at the height of uh, Jim Crow in the 1890s, um, there were editorials that were dashed off to both civilian and veteran newspapers um, uh, talking about just how unwise uh, of a move this was, uh, what nation erects monuments to uh, the leaders of a failed insurrection was a, a very common question. So they protested this. And, and this only, again, I think contributes to the troubled homecoming. It's not just the physical, the psychological, the emotional demands um, that we know of with respect to, to combat stress, to processing all that they had seen, felt, and experienced. It's the fact that they come back home and they see the people for whom they fought uh, willingly extending their hands to their former enemies in a way that achieved a very empty uh, and uh, ideologically bankrupt reconciliation. And, and the Confederate monuments were a great symbol of that. Another question here, uh, I read that the GAR objected to the view of the war in Southern textbooks. Did members have any success in a more accurate view of the war? Uh, indeed, uh, the GAR had a patriotic committee that was committed to um, placing flags, United States flags in public school rooms. They also had a textbook committee that um, kind of similar to their counterparts in the United Confederate Veterans and in the Daughters of the Confederacy would attempt to police textbooks to ensure that um, a historically accurate narrative of the war uh, was told. And uh, of course, they did not have uh, a lot of success uh, that way. Uh, Lost Cause writers, um, uh, of course, got out and um, frankly, they had many more talented writers, um, the Lost Cause did. And they were able to, by the end of the 19th century, largely control the, the narrative of the war. Of course, professional historians um, come along and, and assist in that process as well. The, the lost cause reconciliationist narrative becomes the standard scholarly narrative by the turn of the century, much to the chagrin of Union veterans who never ceased protesting, never um, failed to acknowledge what the war was about. Um, well into the 20th century. Um, good example of that, I think, is the fact that the GAR uh, was out there linking hands with the NAACP in 1915 when D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation appeared, this racist depiction of the war and Reconstruction. The GAR together, Union veterans together with the NAACP, uh, they boycotted um, and, and protested at theaters all across the country, showings of Birth of a Nation, um, uh, which is an index of their ideological commitments. It's an index of the way that they remained committed to the war, but it's also uh, a measure, of course, of the extent to which they'd lost control of, of the narrative by the end of their lives. Well, I think uh, that is all the uh, questions that I'm seeing in the feed here. Uh, Brian, that was an outstanding presentation. Wow. Uh, and I learned some new things, even having read your book several times. And I thank you so much. Uh, and on behalf of the History Consortium, we really appreciate your being here tonight. I appreciate that so much and taking time from your uh, busy schedule to, to talk to us. Thanks so much. Is there well, anything you else you... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that I just want to thank you and the members of the the consortium for uh, for hosting this and for um, bringing scholarship to a broad public audience. It's it's wonderful.
Well, we certainly enjoy doing it. And uh, with the support of folks like you, we uh, we hope to move on and continue with uh, bigger and better things as we start to grow. Uh, I do want to mention to everyone that tomorrow evening, we have been starting at 7 o'clock every night. Tomorrow evening, because of the length of the presentations, we'll be starting at 6.30 uh, with a program on the impact of the war on the civilians in York County, Pennsylvania, which uh, I'm sure folks realize that Jim Orley's Confederates invaded York County and occupied the city of York in 1863 during the Gettysburg campaign. So you'll want to you'll want to tune in for that. And at eight o'clock, we'll follow that with a program on Confederate graves down at Frederick, Maryland, in the Olivet Cemetery. So you'll you'll want to be part of that. Thanks so much. This is Jeff Greenwalt, chair of the History Consortium, thanking all of you for tuning in tonight. And please join us again tomorrow.